again at the conclusion of this program, NBC will bring you more of the latest election returns. In the meantime, we will interrupt for any outstanding election development. From Racine, Wisconsin, and the makers of Johnson Wax Products for Home and Industry, we bring you Fibber McGee and Molly. About 70 miles north of Chicago is the pleasant city of Racine, Wisconsin, population 70,000, whose principal industries include Johnson's Wax, Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coat, Johnson's Car New, Johnson's Cream Wax, Johnson's hey, Drax, hey, the hey, newest... Hey, 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 Harlow. Ixnay, Ixnay the ugly. Okay. Anyway, as we stand in the railroad station in the pleasant city of Racine, a train is pulling in, bringing two people for a visit to the factory where they make Johnson's Wax, Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coat, Johnson's Car New, Johnson's Cream Mr. Wax... Mr. Jo- Wilcox, please. Okay. So we find two people. Guess who? <laughs> hey, conductor. Is this Racine? Yes, sir. Racine, Wisconsin, where they make Johnson's Wax, Johnson's self house and Glow Coat, Johnson's Car New, Johnson's yes, Cream Wax. Yes, 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 we know. Thank you. Come on, McGee, bring the suitcase. Now, you bring the suitcases, kiddo. i got to carry this heavy bowling ball. <laughs> bowling ball? Why did you lug that thing all this way? Well, I heard they got a great bowling team at the Waxworks, and I thought I'd show them a thing or three. <laughs> but sure. why bring a ball, dearie? Does Frank Buck carry his own elephant? <laughs> I don't know. Is he a Republican, too? Well, let's go, baby. Wait a minute now. Where's Dr. Gamble? He got off the other end of the train. This is one of those new kind of trains, Molly. It stops at both ends. Oh. Watch those steps now. Watch those steps. I wonder where we can get a taxi cab to the wax factory. Oh, there's one. Yoo-hoo, taxi. Hey, bud. Customers. Sorry, Max. It's Cabas and Gage. <laughs> well, now, isn't that nice? We hope it'll be very happy. <laughs> Look, bud, we got to get out to the Johnson's Wax Factory. Hello there, Molly. Hello, pal. I've been trying to find you. Welcome to Racine. Well, thank you, Mr. Wilcox. Hi, Junior. Hey, how can we get out to the plant? Why, I'll take you. This is my taxi cab right here. Really? Who's the man you have driving it for you? Uh, He's a distant brother of mine. (laughs) Uh, Here, let me take those bags. Uh Ah, be careful of that grass suitcase, Junior. I just had it resodded. know the way to the factory, Mr. Wilcox? Oh, sure. Hey, hey, driver, uh, take Wisconsin to Franklin, over to Howe, left on Marquette, and west to Taylor, under the viaduct, and cross the tracks, <laughs> then turn sharp right, and east on 16th, past the delicatessen to 14th and Oak. <laughs> My goodness, Mr. Wilcox, you certainly know this town, don't you? Did you live here? Oh, I've been here a couple of times. Is that all? How'd you learn the town? I uh, have a map of Racine at home. Oh. When other fellows are out dancing and frittering away the golden hours, I'm home studying my map of Racine. <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of like Napoleon in exile, marking a map of his beloved France. In the first place, Napoleon was a Corsican. Yeah. And in the second place, he couldn't mark a map because he always had one hand in his vest. <laughs> <laughs> well, gee whiz, I thought, hey... What's in that big bag, pal? You taking up head hunting? It's his bowling ball, Mr. Wilcox. He heard the Johnson Wax employees had a fine bowling team. Oh, they have. And a girls' softball team, tennis teams, golf teams, all kinds of athletics. Hmm. They make wax, too, or are they too busy? (laughs) Do they make wax? Why, the production figures for 1945... Never mind, never mind, Mr. Wilcox. We know they're getting along all right. And the 60th anniversary... Hey, that reminds me. This 60th anniversary stuff. My gosh, don't they realize... Johnson Wax Factory, largest wax manufacturers in the world. Make us a Johnson Wax, Johnson Self-Polishing Glow Coat, Johnson Car New, Johnson... Oh, now, for goodness sakes, we know all that. Come on, McGee. Uh, How much do we owe you, driver? Nothing, sir. Business has been good today, and your affairs have put me in another tax bracket. Funny. Never think of a guy in a yellow being in the red. Oh, McGee, look. 
boy. Isn't that a beautiful building? Ah, that's the Johnson Wax Administration building, Molly. Oh. Frank Lloyd Wright designed it. Frank Lloyd Wright, the airplane inventor? <laughs> no, dearie, huh? no. No, that was Harold Bell Wright. Oh. Frank Lloyd Wright is the great modern architect. Oh, yeah. Isn't he the guy that designs waterfalls running through your living room and tornadoes through your checkbooks? <laughs> Hey, hey, now, look, let me tell you something about this building, kids. Okay. In the first place, look, about this building now. In the first place, no windows. No windows? No. Heavenly days, in that case, you can't sit in the draft, catch a cold, and take five days off. (laughs) And it's air-conditioned, winter and summer. Well, let's go on in, Junior. I want to contact the captain of the bowling team. Hey, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. A few more facts about this building. It's one of the most unusual in America. The dendriform pylons... What's that? Watch your language, Junior. (laughs) Dendriform pylons are pillars shaped like golf tees, used in this building for the first time. In here, we have a cafeteria, moving picture theater... McGee, look, 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 there's Mayor Latrivia. Hello, Your Honor. Hello, Molly. Hello, McGee. How are you, Harlow? Hello, Mr. Mayor. Have you been through this building? It's simply amazing. You see that huge framework over there? That's going to be the finest wax research laboratory in the world. A 16-story glass tower. A glass research laboratory? That's the silliest thing I ever heard. How can you keep any secrets in a glass laboratory? (laughs) See, have you been through the whole factory, Mr. Mayor? Oh, yes, yes. I've seen them making Johnson's wax, Johnson's self-polishing glow coat, Johnson's car new, Johnson's cream wax. Okay, 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 okay. Skip it. Gloss over that part. (laughs) Uh, incidentally, Mayor Latrivia, what are you doing in Racine? I received an invitation to the 60th anniversary celebration. Now, just a darn minute, Latrivia. This 60th anniversary stuff has got me confused. I don't... McGee! Hmm? Quit interrupting. Okay. One of these days, you'll be arrested for breaking and entering a conversation. <laughs> well, gee whiz, this 60th anniversary... As I was saying, uh. I may be chasing a wild goose, of course, but I'm going to make an effort to have the Johnson Wax Company move to Wistful Vista. You'll have to talk fast, brother. They're settled in here like Sidney Green Street in a tight armchair. (laughs) Well, come on into Mr. Johnson's office as soon as you can, folks. All right, Mr. Wilcox. So you're trying to get him to move the factory to Wistful Vista, eh, Latrim? Yes, this is the sort of business we need in Wistful Vista. Mm -hmm. Not only do they make one of the finest products in the world, but it's the kind of responsible business management that has made this country what it is. Personally, I'm getting a little weary of sneers at capitalism. It's made this country great. If some monkeys don't throw wrenches in the gears, it can make it greater. Now, look, Latria, aside from getting an invitation to this so-called 60th anniversary, Racine is kind of out of your tour, Terry, ain't it? Well, I had to go to New York anyway, so I merely added Racine to my itinerary. Huh? Heavenly days. Are you an itinerant, Mr. Mayor? McGee slipped the mayor some money to eat on. I beg your pardon. I am not an itinerant. But you just said... I that... realize that you not having the advantages of a college education, you are slightly non-campus mentors. Oh. But for your information, the word itinerary means a schedule of travel. But you can't travel without money, Your Honor. Now, you just swallow your pride and let us lend you a few dollars. I don't want a few dollars. Well, how much do you want, Dad Raddatz? My gosh, if you're going to hold out for a thousand bucks or something... Please, I don't want a thousand dollars. I don't want any money. I have money. Well, then why pose as an itinerant, Mr. Mayor? (laughs) Traveling under false pretenses, eh? Pocket full of dough and probably rode the rods all the way from Wistful Vista. (laughs) A man in your position, Latrice... I am not a man in my position. I mean, I'm not pulsing under travel... Look! When I said I was an itinerary, an interim, I didn't now, mean to... Now, now, that... now, let's keep this under control, Mr. Mayor. Let's not get excited. My gosh, if we can't help a friend out with a little money... Oh, I... don't be money. I don't need your money. Uh, don't be funny. I don't need your money. The money. If I needed any money... What is this, Tuesday? Look, when I said I had an itinerary, a temporary, there was no such thing in my mind. I didn't... You were the one. I didn't... I didn't... I didn't... I didn't... McGee. Yes? When we get home, let you and I go deer hunting. Oh, he'd love that, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I'll be looking forward to it, Latrice. So will I. I'll wear a red cap and you wear antlers. Good day. I think we should have given him a few dollars, McGee. Oh, he's got dough. In fact, he was born with money. Really? Mm-hmm. 
how it must have astonished his mother. <laughs> well, let's check in with Mr. Johnson. Come on. Oh, oh isn't boy. this a lovely office building, McGee? Yeah. And that lighting effect. It doesn't throw any shadows. Yeah. They tell a strange story about that. One guy came in here, couldn't see his shadow, and thought he'd gone home. <laughs> so he called himself up, didn't get any answer, and had the police force looking all over for himself. They said... Oh, hey, sis, where's Mr. Johnson's office? Are you right-handed, sir? Yes, he is. Well, third door on the left, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Boy, look at the shine on these floors, kiddo. I wonder what they used to make them. Oh, here, here's Mr. Johnson's office. Oh, how do you do? I'm Mr. Johnson's secretary, Miss Morris. Well, how do you do, I'm sure. Uh, will you tell Mr. Johnson that Mr. and Mrs. Bibber McGee are here to see him? From Wistful Vista, sis. It's about the 60th anniversary. I don't think he realizes... Oh, I'm very sorry, Mr. McGee. Mr. Johnson had to go downtown to a community chess meeting. Oh. He said if you arrived to make you comfortable. Please come in and sit down. Well, thank you so much. My, what a beautiful office. Boy. I love those glass walls. Except they're so hard to hang pictures on. <laughs> Boss sure laid himself out a snazzy GHQ to polish the world from. Very impressive. Mr. Frank Lloyd Wright designed this whole building functionally, Mr. McGee. Everything in its place and a place for everything. Uh, may I take your coats and hats? Thank you. Oh, don't bother, sis. I'll hang them right here in this closet. <laughs> Imagine that. He's got one, too. Billy Mills, the orchestra, and the King's Men with Zippity Doo Da. Send the captain of the bowling team up to see me, will you? Certainly, Mr. McGee. Would that be all for now? Yes, I think so. Oh, uh, one more thing. Uh, what is this gadget here? Oh, that's an intercommunicating system, Mrs. McGee. Oh. We have a public address system all through the offices and factories. Oh, there's a call on it now, Mr. McGee. Just flip that little lever up there and talk into the microphone. Okay. Yes? 
Pilot to Control Tower, C-54 freighter on south runway with valuable cargo. Take off instructions. What cargo are you carrying, bud? Johnson's wax, Johnson's self-polishing cocoa, Johnson's car new, Johnson's cream wax, Johnson's... Roger. Hey, this is a marvelous office, you know it. Got everything. Must be awful hard to work with all these conveniences. <laughs> I'll bet... Mr. McGee, there's a gentleman to see you, uh, Dr. Gamble. What? Doc Gamble? Find him an old magazine, sis, and keep him waiting a while. That's what he does to me. Now, don't be like that, McGee. Send him in, will you, please? Certainly. Go right in, doctor. Thank you. Hello, McGee. Hello, my dear. Oh. Hi, Tommy Sculptor. <laughs> my, it's nice to see you, doctor. Uh, what brings you to Racine? I had an invitation to the 60th anniversary celebration. They said it was going to... There it goes again. 60th anniversary. What I'd like to Don't know is... Don't talk so loud in this lovely office, dearie. Huh? It doesn't go with the furnishings. Have a nice trip, Doctor? Oh, routine for me. Somebody on the train heard me call Doctor, and the battle was on. I removed enough cinders from people's eyes to run the hundred-yard dash on, bandaged a brakeman's elbow, removed a man's foot... Removed a man's foot? From a cuspidor. <laughs> he'd, uh, he'd stepped in it in the dark. Oh. And I delivered twins in a roomette, dispensed enough sleeping tablets to quiet an Olson and Johnson audience and mistakenly gave a little boy's mother the devil for using so much iodine on his face. Well, why mistakenly, Doctor? The little boy was an Indian. That I can understand. It takes an Indian to get a reservation these days. <laughs> you, uh, been through the office and factory, Gargle? Yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. An amazing plant. I'm afraid I didn't make much of a hit in the shipping department, however. Why, Doctor? I can't imagine you being untactful except intentionally. Well, they told me that during the noon hour, the employees used the big space for dancing. So what? So I looked at all those containers and said, what do they dance? The can-can? <laughs> I was politely ushered out. Yeah. What are you doing in Mr. Johnson's office, ham hock? Well, we're just waiting for Mr. Johnson to come back, Doctor. I'm handling affairs for him in the meantime. The more important things, anyway. Oh, by the way, Doc. Yes? I brought my bowling ball along. I'm going to show these guys a few tricks. You want to watch me do it? It's a fine, healthy sport, Doctor. It keeps the boys off the streets, you know. Yes, it keeps them hanging around the alley. See you later. <laughs> my, my, isn't it nice to see all these old familiar faces, McGee? Yeah, and Doc's got one of the oldest faces I ever... I could keep it. I'll get it. Mr. Herbert F. Johnson, Jr.'s office, Molly McGee speaking. Oh, oh yes. Send him right in. Thank you. Captain of the bowling team to see you, McGee. Good. If these guys will take some advice from me, I'll put them in more frames than Whistler's mother. <laughs> Mr. McGee, I'm Jerry Babb, captain of the bowling team. Uh -huh. We'd like to have you bowl with us. Well, we'd be glad to, bud. And Jerry looks thin. <laughs> I've developed a cross-footed double-twist two-finger hook that slices across the alley like a kid ducking into a candy shop. I'll be happy to show you, fellas. Well, it'll be wonderful having you with us, Mr. McGee. I've known about Trevor McGee and Molly for years. Yeah? <laughs> How'd you like us last Tuesday night, Jer? Oh, we never hear the show. We bowl on Tuesday night. <laughs> what did you want to see me about? It was a horrible mistake, bud. Skip it. Okay. Mm. Remind me to have that guy fired. Oh, hey, Molly, look at all the push buttons on the desk here. My goodness, Mr. Johnson must have taken a course in boogie-woogie to play, play those. I'll huh? try a couple and see what happens. <laughs> oh. Heavenly days, the inkwells change places. Yeah. Let's see what this one's for. Nothing happened with that one. Oh, no? Look out the window. Huh? Oh, my gosh. Rain. <laughs> Better turn it off, dearie. We don't want to inconvenience people, you I'm know. I'm afraid I busted it. I keep pushing it, and it's still raining. Don't say anything to Mr. Johnson. All right, this, but huh? you shouldn't be doing it. Oh, a gentleman to see you, Mr. McGee. Uh, Mr. Wallace Wimple. Well, for goodness sake, send him right in, Miss Morris. Certainly. This way, Mr. Wimple. Hi, Wimp, old man. I'm glad to see you. Hello, folks. <laughs> What are you doing in Racine, Mr. Wimple? I came to see the advertising manager on business, Mrs. McGee. I've admired this company for a long time, <laughs> and I want to do some work for them. What do you know about the company, Wimp? Well, I know they make Johnson's Wax, Johnson's Carnage, 
Johnson sell polish and glow coat, Johnson. Fine, uh, fine, Mr. Wimple, fine. But uh, what did you want to work at? I wanted to help write your advertising, Mrs. McGee. Do you know the advertising manager, Mr. Connolly? I'll say we do, kid, and he's tougher than a nightclub steak. <laughs> you better screen it through me, boy. Show me what you got. Well, in connection with the 60th anniversary... What do you mean, 60th anniversary? Once and for all, I'd like to get this straight. In the first place... McGee, now give Mr. Wimple a chance. Okay. Thank you. I have a couple of poems which might fit very well into their institutional advertising. Now, let's hear them, Wimp. If, in my executive opinion, they're worthy of inclusion in our fiscal expenditures, I shall issue orders for the consummation of the usual debentures, subject naturally to subsequent revocation. Meaning what? If we like, we use. <laughs> Shoot, Wimp. All righty. The first one is about this wonderful building. It goes, <clears throat> Frank Lloyd Wright designed this place. So cheerful and so bright. He said we'd love it here, and time has proven Frank Lloyd right. I think that's very good, Mr. Wimple. The meter may need another quarter in it, but otherwise it's fine. Well, let's hear the other one, Wimp. Shoot the rhymes to us, Grimes. Well, the other one goes <clears throat> In 1886 A.D., this factory was founded, and all around the globe, the people simply were astounded. Because that same year, the Statue of Liberty was lighted to shine across the sea to the oppressed and benighted. A symbol of freedom the world never lacks. But the symbol of freedom for housewives is what? Johnson. Aha, uh -huh, Mr. Wimple, you're a fine little poet. Were you always poetic? Oh, no, Mrs. McGee. Before I married Sweetie Face, that's my big old wife. <laughs> yeah, we know. Before I married Sweetie Face, I was a masseur. Oh, a blubber rubber. <laughs> you know what I used to call myself? <laughs> what, Mr. Wimple? The man with the paws that refresh. <laughs> well, let me hear from you, Mr. Goodby. Goodbye now. <laughs> Do you ever hear any worse poetry? Yes. Where? In high school. Hmm? You wrote some to me that should have taken the Pulitzer Prize. Hmm. <laughs> Look, McGee. Uh -huh. It's all very well now for us to... I'll get it. S.C. Johnson and Son, Inc. Mr. Johnson's office. Huh? Oh, hello, Mr. Johnson. Oh, dear. Yeah, we're waiting for you, Mr. Johnson. Yeah. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> the community cast is just as important as we are. <laughs> Oh, yes, it is, Mr. Johnson. <laughs> How true. Look, Mr. Johnson, I'd like to get one thing straight. This 60th anniversary stuff. Huh? Yeah, but my gosh. Look, we haven't been on the air for you 60 years. Huh? Oh. Oh, oh, I see. Bye. What did he say? He says the 60th anniversary ain't for us. It's the company's 60th anniversary. I knew that. Well, why didn't you say so? Well, I didn't think it was necessary. Nobody but a big... Well, let it go. Maybe I better. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is the 60th anniversary of S.C. Johnson and Son. It has been under the same family management all these years and has had an outstanding record for business integrity and sound employee relations. And since its founding, the company has been notable for its far-sighted employee benefit plan, job security, and profit-sharing program. We want to congratulate the organization on its 60th birthday and to congratulate ourselves for having them as our sponsors. Hmm, you said it, kiddo. Furthermore, any company that could develop Johnson's Wax, Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coat, Johnson's Car New, Johnson's... McGee. Huh? Oh, good night. And Johnson's Cream Wax. Good night, all. Stay tuned to your NBC station for the latest election returns. This is Morgan Beatty with more election returns. The Republicans have battled one-third of the way along the road to control of the House of Representatives in the next Congress. It's still a definite trend. Landslide earmarks, however, have not appeared in this battle as yet. Here's the score at 9.50 Eastern Standard Time. 
The Republicans have won or are winning nine seats in the doubtful zone. Six in Connecticut, two in Rhode Island, one in Kentucky. They are holding their own in normal Republican territory as far west as the Mississippi River. The Democrats have, of course, a 61-seat edge when you subtract the Republican Midwestern advantage from the Democratic solid south. That leaves 283 seats still undecided, and all of them in range of the doubtful. The indicators we already have in Rhode Island, Connecticut, even in Kentucky, show that this Republican trend is very strong, but it has not been strong enough to unseat Democrats in their most important stronghold. Well, this is Richard Harkness. One of the major questions of this 1946 congressional election, control of the United States Senate, is still up in the air tonight. Now, the Republicans plainly are making heavy inroads into the Democratic majority of the Senate of 10. The New York Times, which supported Herbert Lehman, the Democrat, has conceded Lehman's defeat by the Republicans. Irving Ives, uh, the Republican Irving Ives, is the victor there. And the Republicans seem certain, too, to gain Senate seats in Ohio, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania. In Philadelphia, the Philadelphia record, the Democratic newspaper, has conceded the defeat of Senator Guffey. But to get those ten seats necessary to take over the Senate, the Republicans must unseat Democrats through the West as well. They must carry Wyoming. Patrick O'Hurley must hold his lead over Senator Dennis Chavez in New Mexico. And Senator William Nolan, the Republican, must hold his seat in California. So not until the West is in late tonight, tomorrow morning perhaps, will we know who will control the next United States Senate in Washington. Now that's the top of the election news across the country. Now, latest Illinois and Midwest returns from the WMAQ newsroom. The ratios in the congressman at large race here in Illinois are changing. Emily Taft Douglas is still ahead. 321 precincts, Chicago and Downstate together, give Mrs. Douglas 59,744, Stratton 51,822. Roughly speaking, Mrs. Douglas is leading 10 to 7 in Cook County, while Stratton's Downstate lead at this moment is just under 2 to 1. A projection of these ratios would give Stratton the election, for although Cook County is casting many more votes than Downstate, the higher Stratton percent lead downstate would, in final totals, more than offset Mrs. Douglas's advantage here in Cook County. For state treasurer, 508 precincts give Keyes, Democrat, 94,469, Roe, Republican, 84,557. Since these returns include twice as many Cook County as downstate precincts, that would look like a Roe victory, even though Keyes now leads. Here is a Wisconsin return. For governor, 103 precincts give Goodland, Republican, 8,137. Hone, Democrat, 3,639. For senator, this is still in Wisconsin, McCarthy, Republican, 7,708. McMurray, Democrat, 3,604. There has been no report from Cook County precincts as yet on the race for state superintendent of public instruction. However, and, as expected, Nickel, the Republican candidate, continues to show a substantial lead on the basis of downstate returns. With 131 downstate precincts reporting, Nickel has 19,448 votes, as compared to 9,128 votes for Engel, his Democratic opponent. Well, I have been just handed a late bulletin, which has just come in on the congressman at large race. It's later than the one given earlier in this program. With 471 precincts reporting, Emily Taft Douglas, Democrat, has 83,386 votes. Stratton has 79,751. Stratton has shown increasing strength in the past half hour of return. Mrs. Douglas was leading 5,000 votes with about 170 precincts reporting. She now leads by about 4,000 with 471 precincts out of the state's 9,045 heard from. Stratton has increased his lead down states and is now running better than two to one ahead of his Democratic opponent. In Cook County, Douglas holds a percentage advantage of about seven to five at the present time and shows signs of losing strength here in this city. I've just been handed another bulletin in 202 Cook County precincts, all but two of them from Chicago, for County Judge Jarecki, 51,895, Hunter, Republican, 29,685. For Sheriff, Daly, 49,680. Walsh, 31,303. For County Treasurer, Mulcahy, 50,090. Nelson, 32,002. Keep tuned to WMAQ for the latest news. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.
This is Chicago WMAQ.